I'll just say a few words introducing this video, really, I guess probably just to give it a bit of a context. Um, Andrew and I are just back from Melbourne where we were fortunate enough to be at the opening night of a Melbourne Comedy Festival event um, called Assisted Suicide the Musical. It was, it's a, a musical presented and, and uh, developed by a good friend of mine from the UK, Liz Carr, who's a disability advocate, a comedian and a television star. She stars currently in the Silent Witness program from the BBC. She, um, she, she said in her, um, in the opening night, she made the comment, and we've heard it before, I'm sure, if it bleeds, it leads. And it's a reference to, to our news services and the kind of things that run in their headlines. And both Bill and Julie led to it earlier as well. It's very hard for us to get our messages out. Our messages aren't sensational in the most, for the most part. They aren't the kind of things you're gonna find on the front page of the daily newspaper. Our stories are, take a lot longer to tell. Our, our defense of life in this issue takes a lot longer than a few sound bites and, and a short uh, article on the, on the television. <coughs> but yet we do need to tell our stories. And we le need to learn to increase the literacy in our community on this issue. It's very, very low. The, the um, polls running at 85% uh, support for euthanasia really tell us that. It really says that about 15% of our population, I think, understand the ethical problems to do with euthanasia. And there's a big gray area in the middle that's part of that 85 that I honestly believe really doesn't understand at all what it is they're formally supporting in the poll. So we have a problem. The biggest problem I have, and I hope it's the biggest problem you have also, is that euthanasia is killing. Assisted suicide is helping someone to their suicide. Massive ethical and moral problems. Unfortunately, they're not rating as high with our politicians these days as they probably once did. And I think the polls are telling us the same thing. But let's look at the law just for a moment. So we have uh, laws in this state, we have laws in every state uh, under our criminal codes on homicide which will include prohibition of assisting in suicide as well as direct homicide. Those laws have been around for a long time and we know we change those laws at our peril. But here's the problem. If an unnatural death occurs in Queensland somewhere, the police will likely attend. They will collect evidence, they will talk to people, they will, uh, they will conduct an investigation. If they have enough evidence, they may suggest a charge to the, uh, to the public prosecutor. Public prosecutor will review that and recommend a charge if he, if he thinks it's, it's appropriate, he or she thinks it's appropriate. It will then go before a magistrate who will determine whether or not there is a case to go before the law. It will then go to a court of law. Uh, it will be heard if, if in fact someone is charged with an offence under the homicide code, they will then have an opportunity to appeal. That's a big process. It's designed to protect us all. One, from being murdered by someone else, and two, from being wrongly accused and wrongly, uh, wrongly charged. It's a significant process. And yet with euthanasia and assisted suicide, what we're doing is we're taking out of the criminal code those two particular offences and we're giving the two doctors, maybe three in some circumstances, we're making them into effectively the judges, the juries and sadly the executioners. So we're taking a massive process that's there to protect us, all of us, and we're reducing it and handing it over to two doctors. Now I know some fabulous doctors, so I'm not criticizing the medical profession at all when I say this, but what, what training in the law do our doctors have? What training in ethics do, do they have that's any different perhaps than you and I have? What training in morals do they have? Many will have good training, but we, we're actually taking a situation where we have, in Queensland you have one law, one police force, one judiciary, and we're, we're putting that in the hands of what, thousands of doctors? That's a recipe for disaster. It really is incredible that we should even conceive of doing that. It's a massive risk. And as I think it was Gerbert um, Cheston who said, you, you knock down the big laws, you don't get no laws, you get lots of little laws. And I think really what he was saying is that you lose control. You lose control of, of the protections that our laws uh, give to our society and uh, as Bill has explained, in Belgium and the Netherlands in particular, it's led to a free fall. My friend, um, it was former editor of the Trail newspaper in, um, in Holland, Ger uh, Herbert van Lonen, was himself a supporter of euthanasia at one point in time, and he had an experience with his partner that uh, had a brain injury that led him to a complete reversal. 
He said in terms of his own country that they have removed the legal framework for the phrase, thou shalt not kill, and they've yet to determine what the replacement is. That's what we're facing. When we do that, we create a massive amount of problems. We have to go and look to try and create safeguards to convince the public that the government or the uh, politicians know what they're doing, about, doing with making these laws. We have to create new frameworks for consent. Uh, and we, we create effectively all sorts of problems that aren't properly supervised, never will be, never can be, and we cause so many more problems as we've seen overseas. Now I'm just going to go to this video, uh, to four little clips from the Euthanasia Deception documentary. It was produced in 2015 by our international body, as Julie said. Uh, it is a lot of stories, effectively. Some professional people, some people with personal stories, shot main, mainly in Belgium, but also in Canada in part. And I think it's an incredibly useful documentary. In fact, I think it's the first time anyone's ever taken the trouble to actually go to these places and record these kind of interviews for us. On April 19th, 2012, my mother receives a lethal injection in the hospital of the Free University in Brussels. But you had no idea? No. My granddad developed uh, non-Hodgkin's lymph cancer at uh, roughly 80 uh, years of age. He was basically killed by the medical staff in the care home. My mother was physically healthy. I mean, she was, yes, indeed. She was going in and out of depressions all her life, but is this a reason for it? It is, yeah, apparently it is. We had a few times when the people tried to put us under pressure to have her uh, euthanized. She's just a child like every other child in our family. So my mother, instead of going for the palliative treatment, she said, I want euthanasia. Had there been no euthanasia in Belgium, she would not have applied, for sure. I think it's impossible to put uh, safeguards, because it's also impossible to know what is a terminally ill situation. In Belgium, patients are killed by euthanasia uh, at the first diagnosis of Alzheimer or of a malignant disease of a cancer. So from all the cases, only 60 to 70 percent were declared to the Commission. So this means that 30 to 40 percent of the cases of euthanasia are even not declared and there is no control of the law. She was the one going to die, but we were her sons, we loved her and we wanted the best for her. Was there a consensus? There was not a consensus. As a mother, it wasn't only her quality of life, it was also the quality of life of her own grandchildren. Well, the law says that uh, nobody has to be uh, aware of the demand of the patient. It's only the patient who will decide. It is strange because at the same time, they don't respect the autonomy of doctors who want to not do euthanasia, and they even don't respect the autonomy of institutions who don't want to choose for euthanasia. An aunt of mine uh, was visiting uh, him and she was giving him some water and one of the nursing staff came by and said to her, don't do that, you're prolonging the process of his dying. And she said, what? You see, once you're dead, you're dead. So there's no chance of changing your mind. That's the finality of this. You must understand that this issue is not like any other. I regret my mother had a treatment on that level. I think she and all the other people dying deserve more. We owe it to them. This is a worldwide issue. This is an issue now that is being debated in nearly every country in the world. And there's pressure in almost all jurisdictions of the world to legalize doctors killing their patients. We help people to die controlling their suffering and controlling their symptoms. We don't help them to die by killing them. What is our society becoming? It's a quality society. Only the best will survive. Um, 
a couple of short clips that look at some of the issues that are put before us to suggest that this issue can be regulated, can be controlled, can be made safe. The first one covers the idea of safeguards. As oncologists, we always try to avoid to make a prognosis because we are often wrong. So you cannot know how a disease will react. And therefore, I think putting safeguards is very difficult. The freedom of choice for euthanasia has become the obligation of choice of having euthanasia. For instance, we had the case of a woman who, was, who had been treated for breast cancer, 72 years old, and she was admitted to the cardiac intensive care unit because of heart failure. And the doctor said, well, maybe euthanasia would be the best solution. She was asking for that, but we have admitted her to the palliative care unit, just palliative care, and she recovered. And now she is uh, living for four years more. On dit, the law says the patient must be suffering from a grave or incurable illness that results in physical or mental suffering. Physique ou psychique. Mais il était évident. But it is evident that it would be questioned very quickly why someone who is suffering unbearably from a psychiatric illness should not also be able to access euthanasia. This is what we see today. We see that euthanasia applies in situations of psychiatric suffering that are not necessarily grave or incurable illnesses. So this is what has happened in Belgium over a lapse of time of 12 years. You start with a law for euthanasia in patients who are suffering terminally ill situation. And 12 years later, you have conferences in homes for elderly people presenting them euthanasia, even if they are not suffering any disease and even if they did not think on it from, by themselves. It was said in Belgium when the law was adopted in 2002 that of course euthanasia would be limited to adults. And we see that some years after, we are dealing with younger people. Logically, it was to be foreseen that one would question why an 18-year-old would be able to access euthanasia and not a 17-year-old. Any child who is uh, judged to be conscious and capable by a, by a physician uh, has the right to ask for euthanasia and get it with the authorization of uh, his or her parents. Today there are also texts that speak to neonatal euthanasia, in other words, newborns who are handicapped. And these requests continue to grow. For me, the only clear cut safeguard is to say that a doctor cannot kill a patient. Once that you will admit that a doctor can kill his patient, even if it is in terminally conditions, it will be very difficult to put a, a red line and to say you cannot go beyond this. Because what is a terminally ill situation? How can you judge if a patient will still live three days, three weeks, three months? We help people to die controlling their suffering and controlling their symptoms. We don't help them to die by killing them directly. Bill mentioned earlier um, one of Philip Nitschke's famous quotes, he's made a lot of them, about uh, making the suicide pill available in, in supermarkets. Philip at least has the virtue of honesty, I believe, because what he's saying is that if we, if we were to make this a law, if we were to make assisted suicide or euthanasia available, there is no logic to contain it. There is no logic whatsoever to contain it. Starts with terminal illness, we've heard it. It expands, mental illness, other kinds of suffering, children. Um, Bill gave us some fine examples of what's happening. You logically cannot control it. Anyone who suggests otherwise just doesn't understand human nature. If we go back to 1994 and the, um, the House of Lords Committee, they made that very, very clear when they traveled to, to the Netherlands, again, before the law uh, was even made, they said, look, um, it's, it's inevitable that this will be extended, whether by, by direct action, by someone reformulating the law, by amending it, or by testing the boundaries, which is a normal human thing to do. 
We know that in our children. We set boundaries. If we don't set boundaries for them, they go crazy. When we set boundaries, they feel secure. What we've done, or we will have done if we move these laws, is we'll remove all those boundaries. All right, next clip. This one covers the, uh, the, the, the protections that are supposed to be uh, around the laws that the government will look after us. One of the reasons to legalize in Belgium was the fact that euthanasia was already happening. But now what you see is that up to 40% of the cases in Belgium, so we are talking about 1,000 cases every year, three each day, are not declared. And there is no control of the, of the law. It is a system of self-reporting, which is to say that the doctor himself is the one who fills out the paperwork. Naturally, the doctor will state that there was a voluntary euthanasia and he will indicate that the person was suffering unbearably. Clearly, he will not want to be subject to questioning from the law. Et donc pour cela que, and it is for this reason that in 13 years there has never been one case of euthanasia that has been reported by the governing board to the court of law. Du roi, donc, au, à la justice. One of the main promoters of euthanasia in Belgium, and who was a promoter of the law, he is now telling everywhere that he is not declaring anymore his cases because he is considering this as a, a normal medical act. So he does not see the importance to, uh, to declare uh, his cases to the commission who is evaluating euthanasia. This is a clear uh, problem with the law, this is illegal, but still this man is not uh, pursued for this. I have so many ethical problems with physicians who are routinely killing people, health, physically healthy people, and then they are sending their reports to a commission where they are the co-chairman to judge about their cases. So we created a free guide for physicians who are willing to kill. They have mixed up palliative care with euthanasia and as a consequence some people now are afraid to go to the palliative care unit because they could undergo euthanasia without their demand. We see it in, uh, in reports, official reports. Something is going on in the negative sense because euthanasia is being applied more and more easily. A lot of euthanasias are not being declared, for example. Uh, a lot of euthanasias are being uh, applied without the demand of the patient. The law should be rewritten. The law should be severely questioned and should be rewritten. <coughs> Etienne Montero says in that video that there have been no referrals of any cases to the judiciary. Since that video was made, one, there's been one case referred. And it's important that you know that what that case was. There was a woman called Simona de Moore. She's an 80 year old, very fit and active woman. She was living in a, in a, uh, in a, a nursing home style environment. She had plenty of friends. She exercised every day. Her, she had two daughters. One she was formerly estranged from. The other, her favourite daughter, uh, dropped dead suddenly of a heart attack three months earlier. This was the subject of an SBS documentary, which I think is why the report was ultimately, ultimately made to the ju judiciary about it. She, the doctor, um, Mark Van Hoey, claimed that she had some form of dementia. She clearly didn't. He didn't as far as we know, investigate whether or not there could be some sort of rapprochement with the, um, the daughter that she lost contact with. So, which would, I would have thought would have been the first place to go if you've got someone who's grieving and, and depressed. The woman clearly was grieving. And yet this doctor, uh, you see it on the, uh, on the SBS documentary, gives her a potion and she is made dead. The decision to refer Dr. Van Hoey to the judiciary was not based on the fact that he effectively killed her, that he killed her outside of the framework of the law. Now remember, if, if the law is to be changed, it will be changed and there will be circumstances defined upon which a doctor is protected in law if, uh, in killing a person if he or she does certain things. Now, that protection only exists if they do those certain things. And if they were to not do some of those things, although, we, although as, uh, as the video points out, it's going to be hard to find because it's the doctors who fill out the reports. 
But nonetheless, if they were not to do some of those things, the appropriate action is a charge of homicidal manslaughter because they have breached the exceptions that were given to them. In this case, Dr. Van Hoey was reported not for murdering a woman, not for anything else except for the fact that he failed to get a second opinion from another doctor. I imagine, and I don't, I don't know what's happening there with this case, but I imagine he'll get a bit of a rap over the knuckles, told, be a good boy, don't do it again, um, and he'll still be practicing. One final video. If I have a message to Canada, I would say don't open the door because it is not controllable. The door is open, it will go more and more wide open. That, that's what we experiment here in Belgium. We've had a protection against physicians killing people for more than 2,000 years because of the, the Hippocratic tradition. And we have now arrived at a moment in history when we've opened Pandora's box uh, and the inevitable danger is that physicians become a threat to their patients. Well, in the end, they showed no empathy at all for my pain. They showed no empathy for what I had to go through. And it's even worse. I think that the physician who killed my mother, he has a big, big responsibility towards me and towards my children. I truly think that this has nothing to do with medicine. My advice is, is a, don't go there. Why? Because you open Pandora's box in terms of practice of killing as though it is a normal part of medicine. If Canada one day is to vote uh, for the euthanasia law, I mean, they should invest a huge budget in palliative care, in uh, the formation of volunteers, because unbearable pain is a very relative uh, concept. This is the way my grandmother felt about it. It is the way that people who uh, are on the vulnerable side of the spectrum sometimes give as a reason for, let's say, wanting to end their life, the fact that they don't want to be a burden to others. And this, this shows you that by opening the possibility of euthanasia, you open a sense of burden. You see, before it becomes a legal option, caring for somebody who needs care is just the human thing you do. But once they have the opportunity to choose to let their lives be ended, they're not doing so is to choose to burden their next of kin. That's unfair. Hank's words at the end are quite chilling, aren't they? It is incredibly unfair. The idea of, the, the question of being a burden is, is a phenomenon. In medical literature right now, there is a lot of discussion about this whole idea of consent and whether or not, in certain circumstances, you can truly rely on a person's consent. People with disability particularly feel that pressure. Um, experiences of friends of mine uh, going to doctors, being told, well, you know, you really wouldn't want that treatment, would you? You've had a, you've had a hard run anyway. Um, I, the idea that these people's lives are worth less than others. Um, the idea that our, that our old, older people's lives are worth less than others. It seems to be a bit of a, a, a public meme around these days that people are burdens. You know, we hear, we hear on our television, you know, that we, we need to get our funeral plan insurance organised so we don't become a burden to our family. God knows I want to be a burden to my children. I'm, I'm, I want to live long enough so that I am. <laughs> they deserve it. In truth, they deserve it. They deserve the opportunity to care. To, to rob them of an opportunity to care, I think is just a crime in itself. And essentially it seems that that's what we're doing here. I encourage you to buy Bill's book, you know. Um, Bill, it's an excellent piece of work. Um, it really is. If you can afford it, this video is worthwhile as well. It's $30, it's not cheap. It was a massive investment on behalf of our international organisation and I guess at some points, uh, you know, you have to try and recover the costs. Uh, but it is worthwhile. There's much more to it than what you've seen there. The stories are broadened out and deepened. Some of them are quite horrendous, as you, as you imagine, and, and Bill reflected on some earlier, and he mentioned, in fact, Tom's story. Um, so I, I leave you with that. The Challenge of Euthanasia was a great title for, for, this, um, 
this presentation here tonight. The, the challenge is, is twofold. It's to clearly to stop the legislation when it comes up, but it is also about educating our society about really what is happening here. What are the risks? What is euthanasia? What are the problems with it? And I believe, I firmly believe from my own experience that if we're able to do that, many, many people will turn around and say, you know what, I still like the idea of euthanasia, but after talking to you, I can understand now why we should never make it law. And that's the rub, really. It should never be law. Thank you. Uh -huh.